1861, some people in the United States thought that the best way to avoid the outbreak of a civil war between North and South was to provoke a war with Britain, thus uniting the two parts of the country in a joint effort against a common enemy. Well, in Ireland in 1922, some people had the same idea. Let's join together, fight Britain, start a new war there. Let's put aside our disagreements. Let's avoid a bitter civil war. But just as in America in 1861, that did not happen. Now, de Valera is normally blamed for the road to the, the, the civil war in 1922. What has to be remembered though, is that de Valera was really the civilian leader on the anti-treaty side. It was others like Rory O'Connor, Liam Lynch, Ernie O'Malley, and especially Lynch there, who were determined to fight. And the truth is that even if de Valera had come out in favor of the treaty, he would not have been able to control those men. A civil war, it seemed, was inevitable. What de Valera's involvement did, though, was make it appear that there was now going to be another way forward. And Collins, in this period, did everything he could to try and keep the country together. There was a general election, and without consulting with Griffith, who was furious afterwards, he did a deal with de Valera. There would be a pact election. They would not run candidates against each other. In other words, they would cheat the Irish people out of a vote on the treaty. And ultimately, towards the end, he was forced to repudiate that pact. But the result of that election in 1922 was showed an overwhelming majority in favour of the treaty. Treaty candidates were elected, anti-treaty candidates were defeated, Labour candidates were elected, independents were elected, but very few people who opposed the treaty. And that gave a democratic mandate to those who supported the new Irish Free State. Although those who opposed it were able to point to 1916 and say, well, that had no democratic mandate, but it was popular afterwards. Uh, one of the key things, though, at this time was a speech that de Valera gave on St. Patrick's Day, where he said that if the treaty was accepted, then the IRA would have to wade through Irish blood, through the blood of the Irish soldiers of the Irish government, and through perhaps the blood of some of the members of the government in order to get freedom. And speeches like that were incendiary. Speeches like that were reckless and irresponsible. De Valera, though, tried to say that this wasn't trying to encourage people to rise up and produce those rivers of blood. It was merely a warning, warning that this is what might happen if a compromise was not reached. And towards the end of the, the Civil War, when de Valera was in jail, he reflected on how powerless he had, how powerless he had, how power, his power, state of powerlessness during this period. He talked about how I have been condemned to view the tragedy here for the last year as through a wall of glass, powerless to intervene effectively. I have, however, still the hope that an opportunity may come my way. Now, Ulster hadn't gone away. And Michael Collins, during this period, played a very devious game. It seems that he went out of his way to continue the campaign up north. Because as part of the treaty deal, the British were handing over the uh, places of power, but they were also handing over weapons. And, and Collins decided to give some of these weapons to the rebels up north to those who wanted maybe to continue the struggle. But the danger was the guns could be traced back to the British. So they did an exchange. That in return for them handing over uh, some guns, then they would uh, move them all around. And so you see uh, Collins effectively siding with people who were against the treaty uh, for the issue of Ulster. And in the summer of 1922, there was a murder of a major British uh, official for, uh, army officer, a field marshal, Sir Henry Wilson, who had been a real enemy of the Irish Republicans over the past number of years. He was one of their worst enemies and he was assassinated in London. And there is some evidence, it's not written, 
but some of the people who were involved in that hit admitted it afterwards. There is some evidence that Michael Collins ordered that hit. That Michael Collins, in some ways, was deciding to keep on this conflict behind the scenes. That he would destabilise the government in, North, in, in Northern Ireland. That he would work to reunify the country. And so Collins in this period was playing a very dangerous game. Meanwhile, some of those on the anti-treaty decided to take matters into their own hands. And led by Rory O'Connor, they seized the four courts in Dublin, in the city centre. And they decided to pretty much reenact 1916. Uh, see if the Irish uh, uh, pro-treaty people would shell them out of it. And Collins hesitated. He waited. He would not fire the first shot. And during that time, you have the worst act of vandalism in Irish history. Because the public record office was right beside the four courts. And Ernie O'Malley and others decided to blow up these records. And these were a rich archive of British records going back 800 years. All to do with the land settlement, medieval records. But records that would have been an incredible resource to Irish historians. So why did they destroy them? It wasn't so much that they hated history, it was that they hated this history. These were British records, these were records of conquest, of colonisation. And by destroying the records, by blowing them up with mines, they were also saying that this part of our history had been blown up. But as a result, Irish history was the weaker for it, and a, an incredible array of records was blown up by those anti-treaty forces. But as I say, Collins refused to act until, following the assassination of Sir Henry Wilson in London, the British government gave an ultimatum to Collins. We don't trust you. Those rebels are holed up in the four courts. If you don't go in and sort that out, we will. So Collins had no choice. And in fact, he had to borrow the artillery from the British and the shelling began and the first shots of the, four, of the Civil War were fired and Ireland embarked on a vicious, bloody period of war. We still don't know in Ireland how many died in this conflict. Some say it was as low as 600, some say as high as 4,000. The number that most historians seem to have hit on is about 1,500. And what's interesting is that the fighting took place in parts of the country which hadn't risen up during the War of Independence. And it's hard to really explain that. It's possible that the areas that had seen the most fighting were exhausted. Their men had seen too much fighting, too much killing. Maybe there was a sense uh, in these other counties like Kerry that they felt they had missed out, they hadn't done their duty. They didn't deserve any of the credit for the winning of this Irish state. And so they were determined to show that they also uh, uh, were men of the Republic. You see a lot of fighting places in Connacht where there had been no fighting in the War of Independence. So the map of activity during the Civil War looks very different from the map of activity during the War of Independence. And the war very quickly turned nasty. And it really was brother against brother. Erskine Childers, who had bitterly opposed uh, the treaty, uh, he was arrested, he was captured, and he was found with a gun on him. And no one was allowed to carry a weapon unless they were part of the Irish army. And so he was sentenced to death and he was executed. And the tragedy of that is that the gun had been a present, a present from Michael Collins. It was a small gift gun, but that wasn't taken into account. And Erskine Childers was executed. His son, years later, later becoming president of Ireland. And the fighting degenerated into savagery. And we have examples of atrocities on both sides. In Kerry, in retaliation for some uh, Republican attacks, a number of Republican prisoners were taken out. They were tied up. A mine was put in alongside them and the mine was exploded. And those men were blown to bits although one actually uh, uh, survived. Homes of supporters and family members on both sides were attacked and destroyed. The Minister for Justice during this period was Kevin O'Higgins. 
and Kevin O'Higgins authorised the execution of 77 prisoners, anti-treaty prisoners, who had been captured. And those executions, those murders, they also cast a big shadow over subsequent Irish politics, because this looked like state-approved murder. The fact that these prisoners were being killed in retaliation for atrocities elsewhere. And in revenge for that, they shot and murdered Kevin O'Higgins' father. Uh, Rory O'Connor had been captured after the events in the Four Courts in June 1922. And he and four others were part of the 77 who were taken out and killed. And he was taken out, there was no trial, and he and the other men were executed. And it was really sending out a message, you kill any of ours, we'll kill some of yours. And it shows the bitterness that had descended between these, these men who only a few months before had been fighting side by side. Rory O'Connor had been the best man at Kevin O'Higgins' wedding only a few months before. And now Kevin O'Higgins was signing the death warrant to authorise the execution of his former best man. In 1927, Kevin O'Higgins was murdered on his way to Mass in Booterstown in County Dublin. He was murdered by some uh, anti-treaty uh, uh, followers, anti-treaty fighters, who had never forgiven him for these events. And his death was in a way the last casualty of the Irish Civil War. Liam Lynch was the mastermind behind the Republican side and he was eventually killed in 1923. By then though, the pro-treaty side had lost two of its greatest allies. Arthur Griffith died in, in August 1922, and so did Michael Collins, shot at Bailen of Law, with Collins's lack of military experience uh, proving telling and proving to be the thing that ultimately uh, would kill him there. And you see terrible atrocities on both sides. And with the killing of Liam Lynch, really the anti-treaty side faded away. They had pretty much been beaten into submission and so the civil war came to an end. But it left a legacy of bitterness. So many people in Ireland for the next decade, number of decades, to find who they were politically by what side they had taken in the civil war. Were you a Dev man or a Collins man? Were you a pro-treatyite or an anti-treatyite? But as time went on, those debates became less important. Even though the political parties that had emerged out of it, Cumann na Gael, which later became Fine Gael, and then Fianna Fáil under de Valera, they became effectively the pro and anti-treaty parties. The murder of Kevin O'Higgins meant that legislation was passed in 1927, which said that all TDs, all members of parliament, had to take their seats or their seats would fall vacant. And de Valera, who had been elected the previous year but who had refused to take a seat, had the choice of either giving up on politics forever or taking the oath of allegiance that he had refused to accept as being legitimate during the treaty debates. And being a politician, he took the oath, saying that it was an empty formula of words and didn't mean anything. And that uh, put a smile, uh, a very dry and bitter smile, on the mouths of those who felt that if de Valera had taken that line in 1921, things might have turned out very differently. And by 1932, de Valera was back in power. Fianna Fáil won the election. Common Aguil under W.T. Cosgrave were removed from office. And de Valera became Taoiseach, became leader of the country. And people wondered, would the Common Aguil government peacefully hand over power. The Fianna Fáil deputies arrived into the parliament carrying revolvers, fearing that they would have to fight to take power by force. But W.T. Cosgrave acted as a true Democrat. He handed over power peacefully in 1932. And over the next 18 years, de Valera dismantled the treaty piece by piece, vindicating Collins' words that this would be the stepping stone to freedom until ultimately, the year after he left power, Ireland was declared a republic. And so de Valera was correct 
when in one of his moments of introspection, he revealed that he thought that the more time went on, he felt that history would be kind to the memory of Michael Collins and it would be at his expense.